Lydia is a director at VC First Nations Justice Council, who has over 30 years of experience in leadership positions in Indigenous governance in BC and Canada, and recently served a term as chief of the Quauchin um, tribes. She has been a fierce advocate for Indigenous and human rights, presenting at local, national, international stages, including the UN Permanent Forum on Rights of Indigenous People. Lydia would like us to note that she herself is also a survivor of violence. I invite you to the stage to address this audience. Thank you. Those lights are bright. Siam Nasiaya, respected friends. Siam Nitzchwalmuk Mestimach, respected First Nations people. Siam Nisalt Huen, our respected elders. Haitsayapri Alt Mestolf Tanakwail. I'm thankful that we've gathered here together. I'm thankful for the opportunity to be here with you. And I'm thankful for every single one of you for the work that you do for your helping hands and your good hearts to face some extremely challenging experience in the lives of women, 2S plus, many of us that have faced violence and found ways to, to reach out for help. Thankful to acknowledge the peoples who, whose land we're on that once sustained them. I also want to acknowledge and be thankful for all the helping hands and helping hearts that have brought us together today and for the days that we'll um, be gathered to, to share collaborate, coordinate, and find the ways forward that we all know there's desperate need. Just reflecting just briefly on the, the previous comment about having reached out and supported 34,000 plus victims. And we know that that's just a percentage of those that have suffered that experience and so thankful for that hand that helped and that heart that helped those 34,000 plus but we know we've got lots of work to do. My, uh, my traditional name, my ceremonial name is Khtlilia. I carry my great grandmother's name. I was born in the Kwamechan village of the Kwatsin Mestimoch. I was deliberately born in my grandmother's house because of the injustice that women were facing in the 60s in hospitals that didn't understand our ways of being and didn't respect the strength of our ways of knowing. And so my mother never had any of her children in the hospital. Um, and even I know when I was <clears throat> when I was having my kids, I said, "Mom, I'm going to the hospital." And uh, but she'd say, "Well, don't." She'd be telling me, "Don't let those white doctors tell you to lay on your back. They don't know what they're doing. This is how you're supposed to be birthing." So she'd be giving me all. She knew I wanted to be there, but she also continued to to share our teachings and our ways of being. She was 11 when she first helped with the birthing, so she spent her her life knowing the the ways of being a. Uh, a woman in the world helping each other. So I'm very thankful. Um, I always, I'm always thankful to my mom. She was born in 1924. My grandmother was born in 1884. And so I have this line of knowledge that I'm so thankful for. Um, the biggest, some of the biggest hurt in my life is that I saw what my mother went through as a she spoke our language. She knew our ways of being. There wasn't a week went by where somebody wasn't knocking on the door saying, somebody's ill. She's like, all right, get your boots. We're going up the mountain. We're going to find the right medicine. 
So just so thankful. I always have to reflect on my mother because this is such a strong base within which um, my confidence as a Holmoxlani, as a First Nations woman, um, comes from. So I just wanted to share a little bit about, uh, about myself. <clears throat> Today I have the opportunity to speak to you as uh, <clears throat> coming from the BC First Nations Justice Council. I have uh, I've helped with my I'm gonna I've got a PowerPoint we're gonna move through the PowerPoint as well I've got some notes and we'll make some space hopefully for some questions uh, at the end. <clears throat> so today we'll talk a bit about who the First Na BC First Nations Justice Council is. We'll talk about a pathway that's led us to the development of a, a First Nations um, just a women's justice plan and. Talk about how the strength of collaboration and coordination is so fundamental. And when I hear all of those of you who are represented in this room at a number of different levels, on the ground, at the front line, making policy, developing law, having even holding your hand out to, to directly help those around you, I'm so thankful that the, the, the theme of coordination is, is before us, because none of us can do it alone. No single organization, no single individual. That's the level of coordination and collaboration that's needed for us to find the ways forward, to really address and find those ways to help. We know that many of the systemic issues today are tied to the historical and ongoing impacts of the colonial, colonialization, and we see the disproportionate impact on indigenous women and families. Uh, we still see it today. The theme of community and coordination has two essential elements that are absolutely needed to address issues and make real change and ensure our community members, our women, our girls, and to us, find safety and remain safe. We need community-led solutions and coordinations amongst government, minist government ministries, as I said, our organizations, the BC First Nations Justice Council, and community members. <clears throat> this coordinated approach will help us find ways to close those gaps, move out of the silos of service delivery, and recognize that a collaborative, coordinated approach, we can have such an impact based on our uh, our, our commitments and our investments when they're coordinated and responsive to community needs and priorities. <clears throat> Today, we'll focus on talking about the um, Indigenous Women's Justice Plan. Well, as I said, share the path that's led us to we are today and a plan that, com that intends and seeks to accomplish and make progress uh, based on the priorities identified within community. Um, also, we'll talk a little, I'll let you know a little bit about the, the First Nations Justice Council and what our mandate is and how we're working to uh, come together. So as we all come together today and, and for this conference, I just really want each of you to consider where, where is that point of coordination, where is our respective strengths and how do we join arms and hands and and find those ways to be collaborative and coordinated in, in, in terms of responding to the needs that are out there. So we'll talk about who is the, the, B, um, who is the BC First Nations Justice Council. Um, the First Nations Justice Council was created in 2015, and that was through a, a collaborative effort of the First Nations Justice, or the BC First Nations Leadership Council. So the BC First Nations Leadership Council being the Union of BC Indian Chiefs, the First Nations Summit, and the BC Assembly of First Nations. So these respective political bodies coming together to make a commitment to find a path forward to, towards justice. And we can't underestimate the strength of, and, and process that goes into bringing all the nations in, in British Columbia together and saying, notwithstanding oh, maybe a whole range of other concerns and, and, and priorities and issues, we need to be able to collaborate and coordinate and work together towards the development of a, a justice strategy 
and then subsequently the work towards the development of the um, First Nations Women's Justice Plan. So it came, and I, the, the work for the uh, development of the strategy, um, as you'll see, it was in February of 2020, and I was then on the First Nations Leadership Council, and had the, and EB then as AG announced the, the, um, the BC First Nations Justice Strategy in March. Well, we all know what happened in March of 2020 uh, with COVID and uh, the, the challenges that, that um, existed in that context to continue to lift up and, and find ways to continue the development of the, the strategy and the work. So the, uh, there's a, a commitment to connecting with community, a commitment to honoring the inherent rights, values, and legacy of First Nations communities and the people we serve. So in this way, the Justice Council acts as a conduit uh, between Indigenous legal traditions and colonial legal systems, ensuring that there is a path towards justice. And it's paved with the voices of peoples from community. So just who is the Justice Council? We've got a, just a, uh, for, you, for you able to see the, those that are currently on the Justice Council, Clifford White, myself, Dr. Duda Sayers, Andrea Hillard, um, the Vice Chair, Boyd Peters, and our current Chair, um, Corey Wilson. So this is the, the, the council that has been working together to, to support from a governance and development level the work of the development of the strategy and subsequently the, the, um, the uh, development of the Women's Justice Plan. So these are, it's important to see um, Indigenous peoples committed to doing this work, Indigenous peoples whose hearts, experience, and, and uh, lives really are committed to finding ways forward. So I just wanted you to see the, these beautiful people that are, are giving their time and um, lives to, to find a way forward. So we do, one of the uh, aspects of uh, the work that we do is the development of a roadmap. So we need to, to figure out how are we gonna get there. The, the justice strategy contains 25 separate but related strategies, and then 43 specific lines of action that we can measure ourselves against. <clears throat> and we're currently working with and collaborating with Indigenous peoples, leaders and organizations, service providers, and, uh, and other justice partners to work towards implementation, the coordinated implementation of the, the strategy. So through this uh, ambitious roadmap, um, there we have two tracks. So when we look at the body of work, we understand that we've got a system, that there is a, and I say justice, I do this, a justice system um, the, that is in place that has been driven and been driving and embedding a lot of prejudicial um, pictures of who our people are. And so to be able to understand that in that system, how do we start to do the work to make change within that system, recognize, identify the systemic barriers, and take the steps, actions, to actually address those systemic barriers, and to do that in a collaborative, coordinated way. So we know that uh, in, in terms of track one, we're looking at identifying and dismantling those systemic barriers, promoting restorative justice practices and fostering community-based solutions. In track two, um, track two, our work, track two is it's about sovereignty. It's about recognizing the existing inherent rights of Indigenous First Nations people. It's about recognizing that there is history, there's wisdom and teachings embedded in the ways of being of Hualmuk Mestimuk, of First Nations people, that we need to be able to lift those voices up, revitalize those, those traditional ways of addressing um, conflict of supporting each other, and my mom would always would always talk about, um, you know, when I was a kid, she'd say, you know, honey, the outside world, and she'd use those words, the outside world. They don't understand us. 
when you go out there, they're not going to believe you when you talk about what you really know in your heart because they don't understand. So she was trying to make space for me to say, it's okay to be who you are, but just understand that there's a lot out in the world, a lot of, in the outside world that don't understand, they don't accept, they, they, they actually deny the, the wisdom and, and wealth of knowledge of our peoples. And so it was, a, it, was, it was, I had to carry that, right? I had to carry the strength of who I was, but also know that, that I, I was gonna be facing obstacles and barriers when it came to sharing who I really was in my heart. So track two is about lifting up that, uh, the community, the, the knowledge, the ways of being. And really, it, it's not just an aspiration or an unfulfilled promise, but it's deeply rooted in the cultural understanding and respect for all Indigenous people. So our commitment to this work is a commitment to justice, is a commitment to better and a more harmonious future. It's a promise to support First Nations communities in revitalizing our, their legal traditions, recognizing the valuable knowledge and the inherent, that's inherent in indigenous systems and ways of being when it comes to dealing with governance, conflict resolution, and environmental stewardship. So when, who is, uh, so who is the, uh, uh, the BC First Nations Justice Council, you want to, we do um, have a video here that provides an overview of our journey and our approach to service delivery. And I, I know it's, it's going to be about 14 minutes, but I, I thought it was important that we frame this up because we're looking at fundamentally creating a model of service that is going to help us get the sort of traction we need. It's not enough to stand back and say, we spent this much money. Oh, we, we did this, hired this many people. We want to be able to measure success. We want to be able to see traction and, and say, well, when, when Solicitor General invested this money, we collaborated and we actually found ways that we can get more done. Because I said earlier, we can't, no individual organization or individual can do this by themselves. So what we're doing is lifting up a service delivery model that, and we'll take a, take a few minutes just to, I think I'm at that point now, to, um, I'm just losing track of my notes here. We do have, yes, okay, here we go. We've got the, uh, First Nations across here we go. Columbia have passed on generation to generation powerful ancestral teachings about justice. Justice is embedded in our cultures, empowered by our communities, and grounded in our connections with our lands and waters. The BC First Nations Justice Council honors the sacred work that First Nations have carried out as stewards of justice. For centuries, First Nations have kept their communities safe, healthy, and thriving. And today, they continue to powerfully assert their legal traditions and laws, working with the Justice Council to transform a harmful colonial system into a system that Indigenous people can trust and believe in. Guided by the leadership of First Nations across BC, the Justice Council's work is grounded in the past, present, and the future. We honor the past through the teachings of our ancestors, center the voices and needs of First Nations today, and strive towards a future where self-determined approaches to justice are upheld. With a mandate from over 200 First Nations in British Columbia to transform the justice system for the better, BCFNJC had to mature from an advocacy organization to a fully staffed, operations-focused service provider. In 2021, we assumed the responsibility of Gladys Services from Legal Aid British Columbia. In 2022, we began the work to expand a network of Indigenous justice centres across BC. And in 2024, we will develop a new holistic model of legal aid services for Indigenous people and transition control away from a colonial institution to our organization, ensuring that the solutions to the system that is failing Indigenous people in BC are Indigenous-led and culturally grounded. As an Indigenous-led organization, it is so important that we are the ones developing and providing justice services directly to Indigenous people. However, transitioning operations from a colonial system is never easy. There are many challenges and growing pains, including the lack of funding, discrimination that must be dismantled, and demands that outpace capacity. 
Despite these obstacles, BCFNJC has continued to do the work carefully, meaningfully, and in a good way. Coming up with creative solutions, we have ensured that the legal services we provide reflect the needs, protocols, and cultural traditions of the Indigenous people we serve. We have visited communities across BC and meaningfully engaged with them, responding to their needs and supporting communities to determine for themselves how they want to administer justice. As we progress on our journey as justice service providers, we will continue to engage with communities and bring in talented artists, collaborators, and justice partners to help us. In 2023, we rapidly expanded our organization's capacity and grew from a small team of 30 into a team of over 100 across the province. Our team has worked hard to meet the demand for BCFNJC's GLADU services, which has increased dramatically. Over the last three years of operations, BCFNJC has produced an average of 383 GLADU reports per year, which equates to essentially one report a day. In addition to providing trauma-informed and culturally grounded GLADU reports and aftercare services, our GLADU services department has introduced new protocols to improve the quality of GLADU reports. These include in-house GLADU writer training, a formalized internal legal review process, and a new staff model that saw us recruiting over a dozen full-time permanent staff writers. To gather feedback on the many important initiatives under the BC First Nations Justice Strategy, our team conducted over 90 in-person and virtual community engagement sessions in 2023. Legal Aid, 36 in-person meetings and three virtual meetings. Engaged with Indigenous communities, service providers, and legal professionals to get feedback on gaps and concerns with current Indigenous legal aid services. Themes and feedback from engagement will inform development of an innovative, holistic model of legal aid. Women's Justice, 17 community engagement sessions and four virtual sessions. The Women's Justice team is leading important work to improve justice outcomes for Indigenous women, girls, and 2S plus individuals. Under Strategy 11, the team is developing an Indigenous Women's Justice Plan that is guided and centered by the voices of Indigenous women, girls, and 2S plus. The team went into the heart of communities to gather feedback, stories, and guidance to help shape the final draft of this plan. Youth Engagement, 17 community engagement sessions as well as four virtual sessions. Under Strategy 10, the youth team is developing an Indigenous Youth Justice Plan that will focus on an expanded range of what is defined as youth and will advance prevention. Indigenous Justice Centers, 24 community engagement sessions were held in regions that are now home to an Indigenous Justice Center. To fulfill strategy four, the Justice Council has been hard at work to expand a network of Indigenous justice centers across BC. To shape these IJCs and gather community perspectives and feedback, our team held engagement sessions with elders, First Nations leadership, community agencies, and people working on justice issues. We also formally presented at chief and council meetings, following proper protocol, and receiving endorsement for the work we are doing. Our team of lawyers, writers, administrators, policy analysts, subject matter experts, elders, aunties, knowledge keepers, and staff members is moving forward with humility and are open to learning when missteps occur. We are humbled and grateful when we are called in and taught lessons about protocol that we didn't know. With diverse skill sets, lived experience, and subject matter expertise, our team will continue to work from a place of humility, compassion, and respect. Our team is committed to ensuring our operations are connecting to communities and reflecting their needs. My name is Tiffany Craig and I am Chalton from Northern BC and I am a creative director of Indigenous Design. For every location is on the entrance is a very much in your face 
welcoming from the host nations to visitors mm -hmm. into the location. You are going to see justice according to the protocols of the host nations according to each location and not art on the walls. The most rewarding thing for me out of all of this has been the response from the elders who have experienced a lot in their lives mm -hmm. and their response to these spaces and their response to seeing their protocols done appropriately in a way that makes them feel proud and safe and seen and a little softer um, to be able to feel comfortable to share their stories. Indigenous Justice Centers. Our IJCs are fundamental to ensuring self-determination and decision-making is put back in the hands of communities. Indigenous Justice Centers, or IJCs for short, are safe, welcoming spaces in the community that provide free legal services and support to First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people, regardless of whether or not they qualify for legal aid. Not only can Indigenous people get a lawyer and request Gladue services through our IJCs, but they can access cultural supports such as elders and get connected to wraparound supports such as housing and treatment programs. Rooted in community, our IJCs are also places to work in collaboration with First Nations to restore traditional justice solutions, expand services, and partner on local initiatives. 2023 was a year of incredible progress for our IJCs, with our team growing its capacity. Last year we provided high quality legal services, outreach services, and referrals to over 500 Indigenous people and their families through five existing IJCs in Merritt, Chilliwack, Prince Rupert, Prince George, and our virtual IJC. In January 2024, BCFNJC, along with Premier David Eby and the province, helped us announce the opening of five large regional IJCs. To prepare for their establishment, our team found five new sites. We designed, renovated, and fitted them up for operations, including commissioning new artwork and implementing community suggestions for design, space, and services. We've onboarded over 50 new staff members dedicated to IJC services, including dozens of lawyers. Our services are helping Indigenous people. We received 60 new legal files in March alone, and our staff lawyers are currently supporting 300 legal clients, about 50 outreach clients, and in 2024, we have already made 207 referrals to various agencies and collaborators. As we are 60% of the way to fulfilling our vision of 15 Indigenous Justice Centers in BC, our team will continue to spread and maximize awareness of their services. We will connect clients and people looking for wraparound supports to the new IJCs. Keep an ear out for our advertisements on radio stations in the next few months. Our council would like to acknowledge that with this rapid expansion, 15 IJCs in three years, we are moving faster than we would have liked. Missteps are inevitable, but we commit to learning from them. We ask for your patience and love as we do something that has never been done before.
The last year has been a year of foundational growth for BC First Nations Justice Council and the critical justice services we provide. Our experienced team of lawyers, outreach workers, and staff members are now providing culturally grounded and person-centered justice services out of our nine physical Indigenous Justice Centre locations across BC. With this expansion of operations, expertise, and capacity comes the opportunity to increase access to justice. Now, all Indigenous people, regardless of whether they qualify for legal aid, will receive access to free legal and outreach services through our IJCs. We encourage anyone seeking Gladys services, legal advice, representation, or support on criminal justice and child protection cases to connect with our IJCs. We will continue to build our team of Indigenous experts and diverse accomplices. So please walk with us, join our team, and help us push the transformation forward so we can finally reverse the wrongs of the past and create a better future. Please visit us in person or browse our website for further details on how to access the service offerings of the BC First Nations Justice Council. And please stay tuned for bigger updates as the legal aid transition advances through the year. Thank you. I, I just really wanted to, I, I, I can talk a lot about all of the things that have been shared in this video, but I just wanted to be able to see physically where the um, justice centers are, understand the, the model of service that we're building up, that it's not just a matter of walking through a door and seeing a lawyer and using certain words, but we have aunties that are there. We have elders that are there, because often that first step to be able to tell your story and feel confident in your truth and your experience is being grounded by in a place of trust. And so having the elders, having the drum, just having the, the value of the sound of the drum, the presence of reflections of who we are within these spaces makes room for truth telling and makes space for uh, a safe opportunity to share your, your experience and look for the help and services that you need. So I'm thankful that we are able to spend some time on this video to look at the evolving and transforming um, ways of providing providing service. And, and at each of these, as we opened each of the, the justice centers, we want to create that network, that web we see around us. We invite all the providers, and then we see how much of a network we can build um, when two blocks away there's a service provider that has been doing good work, well, how do we then continue to build those, those networks of um, collaborative uh, access to, to service, to healing, to justice? So this, <coughs> excuse me, Part of the, the work that we do, and we know, we all know that there's been various investments over years, many hand-wringing exercises. What can we do? How can we help? Well, one thing we can do is track what we're doing. Let's look at how we're investing. Let's create a model where we can actually collectively work together to track the, the um, investments, to track the outputs, to track the, the, the added value of creating those, those linkages together. So to fulfill, to fulfill this need, the BC First Nations Justice Council has developed a, a tracking justice tool. So our, it would be our first storytelling website, and, and, and it's also an accountability tool uh, that will help make progress, recognize progress, share information, and be able to not be reinventing the wheel. Um, the, the challenge, I know when, we, when First Nations in British Columbia took over the delivery of health services from Canada, one of the biggest challenges we had was in Ottawa, they'd say, oh, how should we spend the money this year? And then they'd sit around their tables and make decisions. And then it gets to, down to the ground, it's like, well, is it really, is it really, you're not seeing the voice of community, you're not hearing the specific needs that would really make a difference. Um, <coughs> would really make a difference in people's lives and access to justice and, and the opportunities to 
shed, you know, some of the, the hurt and the shame that comes with, with being in positions of violence, having been in a position of, of facing violence myself. I, I even reflect on it and going, gee, I'm, you know, I, I think I got my shit together but as a human being, but yet still I was subject to this oppressive approach from uh, my partner around who I was and what my value was. So, you know, it doesn't matter, you know, if you're just lifting yourself up to as a first step or you're advanced in your education or ways of being, we all need to look to each other for guidance and support and recognize that, uh, you know, there's a lot of vulnerabilities that we have as women um, in this world, in this colonial environment, in, in this legal construct and, and um, you know, a whole world of propaganda that came from government. Um, just a short interlude, the, you know, when in Holmuch women, Holmuch Sleni, First Nations women had a role in, in our societies. We had valuable roles in society. We had a voice in our society. And you know, when the colonizers came, you know, they were still had laws where you could beat your woman with a stick. And they came here and see Holmuch women with a voice that was the biggest driver for them to say, we can't have that. So then we have this whole world of propaganda and, and, and hurt that's really piled on Holmuch Mestimuch um, to try to, again, push down the, the voice of women in, in society. And I won't spend any more time on that, but that, that is really a foundational piece of how we've seen a specific targeted attack on the value of indigenous women in our society. So the tracking justice tool is an important piece where we can actually look at our investments, highlight our successes, bring awareness to the issues, and then also have time to um, coordinate. So anybody can go to this site, look at what, what's happening, where are the investments, and be able to see here's, here's where my body of work might fit in. Here's how I can collaborate and coordinate when it comes to building um, a, a network of, of supports, access to justice, and really um, mitigating against so much of the harms of the, the colonial construct. So we do uh, have, um, as we move forward, the um, Strategy 11, and you heard us uh, speak about that in the, the video. That is the strategy of uplifting Indigenous women, girls, and two S plus voices. <clears throat> <coughs> Excuse me. We, uh, I think that we, it's clear the amount of, of harms that have, have come to Indigenous uh, women uh, and girls and 2S, LGBTQIA um, plus in, in our uh, effort to confront um, the destructive impacts of colonialization that have led to experiences of, of violence and discrimination and harmful interactions with the justice system that broke down that trust in a system that might help. So to address this issue, um, the BC um, First Nations Justice Strategy called for the development of the um, Indigenous Women's Justice Plan. You heard uh, in the video the number of uh, the approach in terms of getting out to community, getting out, getting community voices out, lifting up those voices to be part of um, the guiding um, elements of a, of a, a plan for, um, in terms of the Indigenous Women's Justice Plan that really centers on safety, well-being, and, and, and dignity in, um, for women, girls, and, and 2S+. So overall, the Women's Justice Plan represents a pathway to bring about meaningful and timely action around the demands for justice and, recommends, and recommendations that have sat for too long without action. Many studies, many recommendations, years of, of, of um, recommendations that, that go as far as the paper they're on. So this is what we're talking about, is how do we look at those the, the range of existing recommendations and good work that's been done, build on that, and then track how we're doing when it comes to um, coordinating and um, investing and lifting up the voices uh, and ex lived experience of our um, peoples. So doing things differently. Um, through provincial engagement. So I, I don't know if this one is the next one is. So there's, there's an, here's an overview of the final draft. I'll encourage you to go online and have a look at the, the document and then also look at the, the um, 
the tracking tool. So lived realities, reviewing existing material, um, going in person to, to have those engagements and then to gather the feedback. And then the, the Women's Justice Plan was released at the final draft. So a final draft because we still know that we don't have all the answers there. We've got to be prepared to, through lived experience and continued engagement, to lift up and prioritize um, ways of uh, um, supporting each other, access to justice, creating the transparency, creating some accountability in terms of the sort of investments, as I said before. It's one thing to say, Oh, we spent X. Well, what was the outcome? How are we really making a difference when it comes to helping um, survivors and, and investing in not only changing, this, making systemic change within the current system, but also lifting up the voices of First Nations people's ways of being towards healing? So the, uh, there was a, a series of provincial engagements as well. We've got a great team, a great small team. I lift my hands up to them. I've been working hard. One of the pieces is, yes, we're going to community, but we're also reaching out to the ministries that have mandates that are linked to this body of work, reviewing the, the ministerial mandate letters, looking at the investments that they're making within their ministries, and going and sitting with them in circle and building relationship and saying, here's how we can now collaborate and coordinate more in our investments. And so that's an ongoing piece so that we can work with our partners in, in government who uh, are making, um, making headway, making investments and, and finding ways uh, forward. So just that exercise of going to community, hearing community voices, being able to lift that up to, and with the ministries, and often with government, I, I find in, in many years, I've been working with the government, you have to make space rooms. Like, no, this is, you actually, this is within your mandate. Here's your mandate letter. It's okay, you can do this, and we can do it together. And I'm not trying to be facetious, it's a big, big machine, right? So we have to be able to support each other and lift each other up the best way we can. So the uh, collaborative um, implementation, um, oh, this is building the connections when we're meeting with, Nate, with the ministries. Let's, let's come together. Let's have, take a bigger step towards each other as human beings in terms of our ability to find the, um, the, 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 each step along the way towards uh, recognition of um, the validity of, of everyone's voices and having, lifting up and strengthening each other when we know um, that... Uh, that there are ways forward. And as I said, you know, none of us can do it alone, no single organization, no single government. And that's why this collaboration and coordination is so critical. And the drive, one of the driving forces behind the development of not only the just, First Nations Justice Strategy, but the First Nations Women's Justice Plan. So um, I think I'm just about out of time. So um, I just want to, um, again, that's the, the piece of looking at how we, we continue to help government as well in terms of the sometimes the siloed ministries that each are doing something good but if we can you know create those that, those coordinated approach hold hands and create strength going forward that we we want to be able to to recognize where there is opportunities for partnerships and help the um, I'm going to kind of move along now to the, the, this piece. And so as we're in, in the Indigenous Women's Justice Plan and the related um, strategies and lines of action, so each line of action is, it, it is big, we know that, but if we we've developed the strategies and the actions based on the priorities that, uh, that we've heard, and then we can, with those actions, when we're doing the engagement work within um, community, within government, we can can look and see where am I, what action can I focus on where my uh, um, organization or individual's investments can be. So creating some accountability. Um, we uplift the recommendations for a task force through community coordination and collaboration in addressing gender-based violence against women. <coughs> Pardon me, so creating that accountability tool is that the, um, uh, the, the business of tracking. What are we doing? What did we say we're going to do? What did we do? How do we do? Are we, what more do we need to do? And then as well, looking at prevention. Within a prevention strategy, we maintain um, the, the many recommendations that, um, of increased sustainable funding, including allocation and accountability measures for prevention 
and proactive actions to address the systemic barriers that exist and, uh, and to, to, again, focus on the value and the need to invest in, in prevention. The legal aid, you heard the, the work around uh, um, transitioning towards legal aid, again, access to justice, opportunities for access to, to resources and, and, and justice. And that um, work continues to, to advance as we speak. Uh, the <clears throat> I just wanted to say as well that there, there are many, there are many ex existing bodies of work um, that have happened and we wanted to really draw on that and, and the recommendations that exist and, and lift those up in, in, as a context for further engagement. We also, in terms of policing, where I don't think any of us are unaware of the, the um, challenges in the relationship with um, Indigenous First Nations people and police. The historical relationship was was such that they helped take our children away and those sort of things don't fade away easily in terms of trying to see um, and recognize um, uh, policing as a, as a safe space. I know when I faced violence, I called my mom, you know, because I just wasn't sure I was going to be treated fairly. And, uh, and then the, the work around legislation and policy, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, DRIPA, the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People Act here in British Columbia. Part of that body of works uh, driving peace is the alignment of laws uh, with um, the UN Declaration. And, um, and I know I'm uh, just the last comment, I was doing an interview um, with the, in the radio and, and we're talking about violence and how, how, how are we going to be able to address this, this business of prejudice and racism and, and he kind of chuckled and said, yeah, how are you going to do that? I'm like, well, first, we can at least start to remove some of the most discriminatory, harmful aspects of Canadian and provincial law that are harming our people now. So it's not a straightforward path, but we do know that there are, are areas we can target in terms of um, making a difference. So. This, uh, this is, I know I got just a few minutes left, so just to, to wrap things up, I just really want to again lift my hands up to you. I feel it in my heart. The work that you're doing is so important. And when we find those ways to reach out to each other, to coordinate and collaborate, we are going to get even more done. And the voices from community, the lived experience, the, what we learn from that are some of the most first steps we can take to help each other. And so it's with a full heart that I, I look around this room and see so many that have a role in, um, in addressing issues of violence against women, uh, 2S+, plus, and generally understanding that there, there is a way that we can work together with our good hearts and um, resources and take those steps to make sure that we are advancing and getting traction when it comes to the investments we make. So um, with that, I'm, I'm so thankful um, that I had this opportunity to spend time with you today. Uh, thankful to have a, a role on the First Nations Justice Council. I've also spent 10 years as chief of my community, the Kowatsin, Kowatsin tribes, um, and have committed my life to, um, the reason I got a law degree was because I saw how that tool was used against our people. So thank you all so much.